so again, uh, take two. My name is Joanne Yarrow. I'm the Director of Community Engagement and Education at Syracuse Stage. And this is workshop two of a four part workshop that we're doing um, with, in conjunction with a, a production called The Most Beautiful Home, Maybe. And at the end of uh, this presentation, I'll, be, I'll welcome you to Mark Valdez, who's in Los Angeles, who has been creating this project about home and security, about what it means to be exiled in our own country um, because of the housing situation, and what it, you know, what can it look like if housing were available to all as a human right. Um, in the same way that education is. And uh, the first workshop that we did, we talked about the history of Syracuse and the history specifically of the 15th War and what that looked like. And today we're gonna to be talking about current convention, like what does it look like to uh, be a resident, specifically we have residents here pioneer homes, and what does it and the effects of when you start saying to people we're going to um, move you out of your communities? What how does that affect the communities that um, that have been created there? And um, so today I'm, I'm really really honored. Um, we have uh, Lanessa o Owens Chapman Esquire. She's going to be leading us off today. Uh, David Rufus, who is going to be all, another uh, community member. Um, both are from the uh, New York Civil Liberties Union. Union? Did I say that right? Okay, good. And um, we have Joaquin Pascal, uh, who is a current HIP community member. He's going to be kind of connecting with us as well. And uh, we're going to be listening to them. And this is going to be a very interactive um, evening this evening. As you can see, there's lots of sticky notes. There are plants. There's very like, why are there plants? So it'll be, it'll be revealed later. And, um, uh, and I think that if you have questions along the way, um, you can either ask them and I can repeat them, or you can write them and I will, I will ask them for you. So I really, again, want to reiterate, this is a safe space, um, specifically for anybody who lives in these communities and wants to voice any concerns or you know, experiences about their communities. So without any further ado, Vanessa. Uh, good evening, everyone. So I am Vanessa owens Chaplin, and I was asked to talk about the current situation, um, current living condition situation in communities. And if you know me, then you know I have to go back a little bit and talk about history. I can't help it. I don't know how to connect the future without talking about the past practices. So I am going to get a little bit into um, the history of zoning before we talk about the actual current conditions. And I think it's important to think about um, zoning in a way of we don't actually think about zoning on an everyday basis. Like we don't wake up in the morning and think about, well, how is my neighborhood zoned or how is my street zoned, right? But zoning actually really impacts the placement of people and actually impacts what your neighborhood looks like. It actually impacts where you can live in a neighborhood and what's allowed in your neighborhood, right? So when we think about zoning, we think about, do you feel secure in your neighborhood knowing that you won't get a power plant next door, right? Because you're zoned in a residential community. Do you feel secure in your neighborhood knowing that you won't be exposed to multi-family housing because you live in an R1 or that means a single family residential community, right? And we have tons of those communities in Syracuse across the nation that we don't even give a second thought about what are the impact of those zoning laws in our community? Who controls those zoning laws? And so when we talk about the, the design of neighborhoods and how folks live. We have to really get to the core of, well, how is that land regulated to determine who gets to live there and how. So I'm going to talk a little bit about zoning before I get to the meat of the talk, but I feel like it's just necessary to kind of paint the picture of why do we have certain communities where there are all residential single family homes, and then why do we have other communities where there's primarily renters, right? Is that a coincidence that something that just happened or wasn't done by design? So I think we have to have that conversation first before we get to the current conditions of people living in a community. So I do apologize for not following Joanne's uh, uh, guidelines to the T, because I am going back a little bit of history. Yes, Aggie. What I would like to see is make the mask for all of the presenters, the 
Um, so what they did is they wrote a contract, and in that contract, it simply said, Riley, I am buying this house for the purpose of living here as my full-time residence. And they wrote it that way because they wanted to challenge this thing in court. And this was in Kentucky, Louisville, Kentucky. It went to the lower court in Louisville, Kentucky. The lower court said, now there's no problem here. You're violating the uh, loaning law. This contract is no good. You cannot sell your home to Riley. They appealed that decision. They took it to Kentucky Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, no, the zoning law has a rational basis. It doesn't matter if it's discriminatory. It has a rational basis to protect white communities from violence and disturbance. So we were upholding that. And it made its way to the Supreme Court. And the specific question for the Supreme Court was, is this a violation of the Equal Protection Clause? Right? And the Supreme Court decided to ignore that question. So they stayed away from the race question. And what they actually ruled on, this is a violation of Buchanan's right to contract. So they focused on a white man's right to sell his property to whomever he wanted to. And so because he was denied his right to contract, it's unconstitutional. And I think it's important to put it into context because it has never been ruled that you cannot do this based on race. It has been ruled on the fact that you cannot violate someone's right to contract. Okay, and so what happened in uh, after this ruling, segregationists were faced with two distinct problems. How do they keep lower income African Americans from living near middle white class people? And how do they keep middle class African Americans from moving into middle class white neighborhoods? And I say segregation, segregationists because they were actually appointed by our president at the time. They were no segregationists on the record. They were elected officials. They were mayors in southern cities. Um, and they devised this plan. And that plan was a standard state zoning enabling act of 1924. Um, and that actually is a second version of the 1921 version, but this is the one that has made its way. And it was distributed to 256 cities across our nation as the guideline on how to maintain white middle class without allowing black middle class people to infiltrate your neighborhoods. And I say this because, again, it's important to understand the zoning law because that really tells you where you can and cannot live, where you can work, where you can go to school, what you're exposed to, what environmental toxins you're exposed to, what type of access you have to tra public transportation, right? So all of these things are kind of the bedrock of how a person is able to enjoy a quality of life. So while most people tend to think that they just kind of happen by happenstance, what cities started to do is they started adopting the zoning plan and building the city of their dreams, right? So they started building these communities based on these zoning plans. And Syracuse was no different. Our very first uh, comprehensive zoning plan happened in 1922. So as you can imagine, it is riddled with, if you go back and read it, it's, it's cringeworthy. It is riddled with covert racial motivation, right? And so I know we talked a lot last week about redlining. That was one aspect of it, right? Because the zoning had already been set in stone on where folks were going to live and what they were going to have access to. And what is solidified is exclusionary zoning, basically meaning if you don't live here, you cannot afford to move here. And so what it set up in Syracuse are communities for the wealthy, communities for the middle class, and communities for the blacks. And, and, and also browns. And what do I mean by that? I mean that if you look at black communities, they have the most diverse income than any other neighborhood. So when we talk about creating mixed income neighborhoods, black communities are already mixed income neighborhoods. You can have a, a community member making $80,000 with the next to someone who's on section eight. That's because of zoning, segregation, and it's still lingering. There's not anything that we have all, we have addressed as a community in Syracuse at all. I just want to kind of put a perspective on. Since 1922, we've had this in place, and there have been piecemeals, obviously, to the zoning plan, but there has never been a comprehensive plan. And the comprehensive plan that we're doing now, in 2021, is called the Rezone. Is anyone in here familiar with the Rezone? So Rezone Syracuse, the first time that the city of Syracuse is making a comprehensive change to their zoning policy, right? And I think that for one, I would hope that everyone would know about this because of the huge impact the zoning has had on these communities across Syracuse. But one, to make sure you have input on how this, um, how this is playing out. And so 
I think you guys saw this picture before. Um, but this just goes to show you that on, you know, on the, I think it's on your right, you'll see what it looked like prior to urban renewal, the mass transit movement, right? And so you think of, well, why did you have all these folks here? And your immediate thought is, well, it must be redlining, which is partially true, but it's in large part because of zoning. Right, this area was zoned for multi-family use. This area was zoned for apartment buildings, multiple dwellings, right? So it was zoned for that community. So once you get into that community, you're trapped. Why are you trapped? Because either you buy a house in Meadowbrook or you stay in a community you can afford, right? There isn't many options. And if we're talking about back in that time period, if you were a black person, you could not afford to buy a house in Middlebrook, but also you can have access to buy a house in Middlebrook because of these developments, right? So we know that that wasn't a possible thing. So during this time period between redlining, urban renewal, and the highway transit movement, the Black community lost 101 acres of land. And I think that's important to put in perspective that 101 acres of land was lost by the Black community between 1930 and 1960. That's an enormous amount of land. Um, and so what, it, what was the results of that, right? The results of that, they live, learn, and play in concentrated areas of poverty. That's the result, right? And that's the real result. They live, learn, and play, not only in concentrated areas of poverty, also, the most environmentally toxic community in our, in our county has the highest rates of asthma in our county, right? So we think about, well, why is that? Oh, because this area is zoned for light industry. And you don't find it just in Syracuse. It's not, it's not something that just unique to Syracuse because Syracuse are bad actors. You find this across the nation where black and brown communities are zoned residential with light industry. Right? And what does that mean, light industry? That means that's where you put your highways, that's where you put your steam plants, that's where you put your power grids, that's where you put your waste management facilities, right? And why is that? Because it's zoned light industry. And I want to know how many of you here think that they knocked that community member store and said, hey, do you mind if we zone your area as light industry? <laughs> right? So we, we have these regulations in place that large and part communities are not even engaging in, right? They're not even having conversations to say, well, why is my community zone white industry? Why is it okay to build a midland switch plant in the middle of my neighborhood? Why is it okay to build a central hub station in the middle of my neighborhood? Why is it okay that I'm being overexposed to toxins or have access to a poor education or cannot access wealthier communities? Because they're locked out, that's why. So now we're at a pivotal moment where I'm getting to the current. And um, we have uh, a lot of projects happening in this community at once. And I think we're always on the, on the alert of, is history going to repeat itself, right? Or are we going to do something different this time? And in large part, it depends on if we actually come to terms with the harm that we have caused in the past by our past policies. We have to look at these things and dig into them and figure out what did we do wrong? And how are we going to change it? I don't think it's enough to say, well, we're in 2021, we would never do that again. That's not true, right? Whether it's ill intent or just plain ignorance, if you're not intentional about addressing the racial injustices that have happened in this community, then we're going to repeat them. So the question remains, out of all these impending projects, is it going to be displacement, gentrification, or actually access to opportunity? And so I'll give, you, I'll give you an example, and I think all of you here, or should maybe you don't know, that I work large in part by the IED, I work large in part with the IED1 project, right? And so what we know from IED1 is when it was destroyed, it, dam it, it, it damaged 500 homes and businesses, right? So it displaced 500 families. Um, that was thousands of people that were displaced. Um, and the idea behind it was, we have an area that's overcrowded with Black people, created by zoning and redlining, and just plain racism. Um, it's overpopulated, it's blighted, what really meant we're not giving it any resources, so it's blighted. It doesn't qualify for, for home loans, so if you need to get your roof fixed, 
If you lived in that neighborhood, you couldn't. So then they started to say, well, this neighborhood is like it. It's the slum that needs to go. And so they created all these plans to help them, right? So the plan was, well, one, let's just start with the new one. We'll just kind of move them around. Or let's put a highway through their community, and that one, they'll have to move. So we'll start breaking up these communities of concentrations of poverty. So what does that sound like today, today's time? So here we are again talking about Syracuse's concentration of poverty. But what was the end result of urban renewal and the mass transit movement? I think we can all agree it did nothing for the Black community but caused further harm, right? So you had a community that was struggling, and then you had government-backed policies all the way from the local to the federal that caused further harm. And so we have to ask ourselves, is history going to repeat itself? But also, who's going to benefit from these projects? And I think all of you have heard about the folks that oppose removing ID1. And the biggest argument has been they have businesses along the highway that is going to suffer if the highway is removed. Now, if that isn't a slap in the face for the community that was further harmed by ID1 to say, we destroyed your community for the benefit of one urban renewal creating Syracuse's downtown, because that's what it did, right? We got the Iverson Museum, we got the criminal courthouse, we got the Civic Center at the loss of all of those homes. So we built our city center on the back of the black community. And then businesses developed along the viaduct to gain economic gain as a result of the destruction of the black community, right? So you have all these things working, but not only let's look at the destruction of the black community, but who benefited from the viaduct? Interstate commerce benefited from the viaduct. Local businesses benefited from the viaduct, right? Liverpool, town of Salina, we've been hearing it for three years now, who benefited from the viaduct? They don't look like the folks that were injured by the virus. So we have these projects coming, right? And these projects are again supposed to be addressing the concentrations of poverty in our community. Um, they're supposed to be trying to redress the harm. But the, I think the question remains, what if we put that like this? What if we compare this chart to the chart that I just showed you that had the urban renewal, the red lining and the mass transit? Again, we have a situation where we have local, federal, state governments deciding how to help this community, right? And I have the dots next to it because the story is still untold, right? We don't know how it's going to benefit the community. But what we do know is that we don't have the community members in the driver's seat, not in the, not in the passenger seat, not involved in the conversation, but actually in the driver's seat making the decisions. And if we don't come to terms with the harm that we caused in the past, it is very likely we can have the same result. And the reason I'll talk about zoning, as we're going through the process of zoning, we have as an organization and, and independent resident members an X rezone to do a racial equity impact statement. What that means is we want them to do an analysis to determine how has rezone impacted black and brown lives from 1922 to now. We want to talk about how has zoning impacted their lives. And we want them to do an in-depth report on that. Other cities have been, have, have been doing this, and we're asking Syracuse to do the same. We talk about Blueprint 15. It's a national initiative to break up concentrations of poverty in Black neighborhoods. Blueprint 15, again, is, and there's 23 purpose-built communities across the nation. They look at it from a holistic standpoint, right? They, they talk about cradle to the, to the grave kind of services. But if you don't have community members driving and deciding what's going to happen with this project, it can easily go the wrong way. Because I need you to think for a second what you're talking about when you're talking about Blueprint. And this is, I'm not actually Blueprint. I have had several meetings with Blueprint where we're all on good terms, but there are some realities that we have to address. For instance, we talk about integrating this community. We talk about integrating the whole 15th Ward, what's left. Well, what are we saying when we're talking about integrating? What, what do you think about when you hear integration? Awesome. Right, racial integration, that's what you think. Economic integration, that's what you think, right? So what does that tell the community that lives there right now? If, if we're talking about integration, can we have integration without displacement? Are we going to make the footprint bigger or we're we going to say some of you black folks got to move so some rich white people can move in and then the whole neighborhood will be better? Right? That's, that's, that's the psychology behind 
what we're talking about when we're talking about redeveloping a community that's already existing. And what we need to be careful of is we need to make sure we're not using people or treating people like they're in objects. They can be moved around, pieced around for the betterment of the whole community. Because how would you feel if you were that one family that had to move to allow integration to come in and they benefit from the community that you're tethered to? You know that this is your community. So we have to think about Blueprint in a way, in a critical, with a critical eye to say, when we're talking about integration, if we're not talking about also with the same vigor and the same resources, integrating high opportunity neighborhoods, then we're only kind of focusing on one community. And again, that's the black community for the betterment of the entire city, right? So I haven't heard much conversation around let's integrate Meadowbrook, let's integrate Stratford, let's integrate Central Square, let's integrate Cicero or Baldwinsville. Right? I haven't heard one person say, you know what, your area is just too white and too middle class and too single family and we need to integrate this. Right? And it may sound ridiculous, right? But think about it in terms of we're talking about integrating a black community with a mixed income community. We're not talking about integrating all black communities in Syracuse, just the one that happens to be the closest to downtown Syracuse. So there are a ton of red flags that are going off the community members. And it's my intent to raise those red flags to say, this is how they're feeling. We have been door knocking for years, and this is the sentiment, right? Why are they integrating my neighborhood? Why are they knocking on my door? Why does my neighborhood be mixed income or mixed race for people to care about me in this community? And that's the kind of narrative we have to be very, very mindful of. And then, so I'll move on from there. And then we'll talk about the highway deconstruction movement. So we are all pretty much collectively agree that community grid is the best option, right? And I say it's a movement because I think many of you may have heard, heard that the IH1 um, is going to be a model for the rest of the nation, right? We're going to make this community grid. It's going to be the model for the rest of the nation because all of the highways that were built during the vast, vast uh, transit movement, they're all coming down at the same time because they're all reaching the end of the useful lifespan. So now we're talking about all these viaducts across the nation that Robert Moses and Bill and others need to come down. And so how can we redress racial justice and environmental justice. And sometimes they become buzzwords with not a lot of meaning behind them, right? And I think a perfect example of that was the placement of the on and off ramp. And they put it 150 feet away from school, right? And this community came out and like, we're not having that and, and they're going to move it. But that's an example of, are we really addressing racial and environmental justice by decomposing these highways or are we doing something different? Because now what's happening is something that happened in San Francisco that they took their viaduct down and that land was a gold mine. Because all of those viaducts are in the city center because that's where black folks lived when they were built. So we have to think about, is the mass transit movement really going to serve its purpose or is it another way to gentrify and develop neighborhoods? So we have to be mindful of those things, but I just kind of want to say, bring it full circle. Those proposed solutions that we saw in the 1950s are similar to the proposed solutions that we're seeing in 2021. And we have to be you know, mindful that we're paying attention to that and allowing community members to really, um, to really, really um, be in the driver's seat when it comes to how those plans come into fruition. And so after our long hustle of, of talking to several community members over several years, what we learned is one, we need to end exclusionary zoning. And that should be across the board. Um, there are, in the current rezone plan, we're not removing any of our exclusionary zoning. It's staying exactly as it is from 1922. Um, they're adding more high density neighborhoods, which is another red flag for community members. Uh, for example, the area that's located around the viaduct, the Pioneer Home Central Village area, is going to be rezoned to be mixed income, high density, uh, which is very alarming because that lends itself to condos big building, big developments, um, which lends itself to rent inflation, <laughs> raises in property taxes for folks who want to live in it, or, um, or uh, low income. And we need to uplift communities. We need to start providing resources to communities as is, and not wait for some big redevelopment plan to come forward. Uh, how are we going to go with these recommendations now? Do an hour at the end. Hour you want to do it now and then we'll do it? 
I mean, so I'll just go through these recommendations really quickly, but there's also a paper that Joanne has that she can hand out to that has these outlined if you want to kind of look at, look, look at these a little bit closer. Um, but some of our recommendations for future land use, um, we must have land policies that enhance and restore communities. We must establish a community land trust. We must invest in our current communities and this visionary zoning we talked about. For rezone, require a racial equity impact statement. Um, we talk about exclusionary zoning again and require tax abatements, rent regulations for historically marginalized communities. Thank you. So the next person I'm gonna invite up is David. And but before I do that. Um, but I wanted to read for our panelists who are going to be talking about their community, about this community here. So can you hear me okay? All right. So we asked the question, what brings you here? All right. Uh, knowing the frustrations around housing in Syracuse, what brings me here? is I want empathy and better understanding for my family and how I can help. What brings me here? I came to see what information I could learn. I'm from the community this forum is about. I want to hear. What brings you here? I'm getting extra credit for class. <laughs> and the topic aligns with what I'm currently studying in school. What do you bring here? an open mind, and the perspective of a current SU student. What brings you here? I'm a retired community mental health nurse. I was in Syracuse during the 60s and the end of the 15th Ward. I care what will happen now. What brings you here? An is uh, interesting housing issues in Syracuse, both past and present. What brings you here? We're at a watershed moment, not only I-81, but also New York State climate planning and Joe Biden's infra plan. I'm moving people. I'm with moving people, transportation coalition. Move people, not cars. What brings you here? My work with families in our community. I bring creative, political, and cultural curiosity. What I bring here, the willingness to help. What I bring, I bring an ability to see structures in details. So this is our community. And with that, welcome David. Um, thank you. Those were extraordinary. And I think some, what's, what's really nice about those is that it helps you to sort of uh, paint the picture, begin to pick the brushes, look at the paint, and sort of say, well, this is what I'm going to do as I move through this process. I think for me, one thing that I'd, I'd like to do while, while I'm up here is sort of take you on a journey with me, you know, just an opportunity to understand how I with what I've experienced, the places that I've been, the things that I've done, and those kinds of things that help me shed a picture about the community that I live in, I love in, and that I've spent my entire life in. And this is that, that community called public housing community, a community that's been targeted, that has been ID'd as a possibility for change. The other thing that, that scares me about it, that most of the time in the community that I live in, with people that look like me, whenever you hear words like concentrated poverty, when you hear violence, when you hear not enough uh, food, not enough stores, not enough businesses, most of the time those things lead us to things like gentrification and displacement. That's not what I'm looking forward to as I live my life in this community that I've been in for more than 60 years. I think one thing that's critically valuable is that as I grew up in this community, I, I went. To, I had the opportunity to attend Washington Irving Elementary School. It's not a school district. 
So there I went to school and I spent my, my years in kindergarten going to that particular school. And then when they started this movement, this mass exodus of, of Black folks living around the school, the near the school, we lived on Washington Street, we lived on Seaboard, I mean on Cedar Street, we lived near at Fayette Street. And so when they began to start to talk about this mass exodus of the people having to move, we would then uprooted and move from this particular community. We had to go to public housing. Something that I find extremely valuable. I look at it as something very, very important. But on my way to public housing, I had an opportunity to stop at Coden Elementary School. And it's now called Dr. King School. So back in the 60s, as a fifth grader, fifth, sixth grader, I had a chance to meet Cassius Clay. Cassius Clay, we know now as Muhammad Ali. And I think that one of the things that was so invaluable and so important to me is that as Cassius Clay spoke to us, this line of uh, sixth graders that he said, you can't, you gotta stay in line, you can't touch them. He says, uh, well, listen here, he says, you guys, listen, don't let people take your community from you. Value your community, take care of your community. And that, that thought to a sixth grader, uh, 11 or 12 year old at the time, it made you think like, oh, so they're taking something from me. Because typically, you don't know anything about what's going on except for what your parents got. My father was a truck driver. My mama works for a school district. So they were spending their time trying to make sure that they take care of one of 10 children at that particular point in time. So as we talked about Cassius Clay, he explained us the, the necessity and the importance of saving your community and being a part of your community. And we then had to experience the loss of Martin Luther King. So after we finished with Cassius Clay, we lost Martin Luther King. So again, we began to fall into this denial, this, 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 this belief that we are no longer important. We, we are of no value. We don't, we're not important to people. We're not important to this community. So all of the things that we do and all the things that we've done that we thought we were contributing to the city has no value to that. So we pushed and we argued and we fussed about the school being named Dr. King Elementary School. So I take pride in being a part of this, this change that came to my neighborhood. But the other thing that I thought was so valuable in my neighborhood, that there, there were houses on Oak Avenue. If anybody's been to Dr. King School, they know that it's bordered on Rainer, um, was Castle at that time in Oakwood Avenue. And on the back of it, it used to be Rainer. At, at that particular point in time, sometimes it might have been from Monroe or we could say McBride. But we've seen such a value in that school. There were houses on the street, there were businesses on the corners. Miss Craig used to have a food shop, Miss Gray used to have a little boarding house. And so my experiences took me through these places. I wandered through these neighborhoods with big eyes, always looking for my big brothers. I had five older brothers, and I always had a chance to. Wander behind, look for them to see what are you guys doing in the neighborhood today? What's so exciting about today? And then 68 just sort of popped up and it turned into a riot zone. You know, we lost King. It was the assassination of King, it was another assassination. We lost the president. And my neighborhood turned into a tear gas community from Frank Sardino, who was the police police officer the chief of police that took the part of town. So we experienced all the mishaps of the gas, the police cars, the rioting, the looting, but what it was, it was still my community. So Paul Stoll, who's on the corner of Rainer Ave and Oakwood at the time, he sat on his roof and he said to folks, yo, listen, I'm gonna give you a bottle to throw, don't break my weapons. Don't break my weapons on my store, but that was Paul. So that was an experience, that was still an experience and it was still home to me. It was still a place that I lived, that I loved, and that I experienced greatly. So we went on through those particular point times, and I had an opportunity to move on to high school, junior high school. My day, seventh, eighth, and ninth graders were in school together. We were going to go to Eastwood Junior High School. Our mother said, you're not going up there because they're throwing bricks at people's kids who are going to Hanover High School. So we, we watched our neighbors, our friends, our buddies who were in the 10th, 11th, and 12th grade, get on buses, going up to Hanover High School to be bombarded with bricks and bottles. And white folks lined the streets, white folks lined the streets to, did I, did I hit it? Yeah, oh, there it is. 
And white folks line the streets to throw bottles and bricks at, at my cousins, my brothers, my sisters, and my friends who lived in the neighborhood at the time. We were an instrument and a tool to help change the city of Syracuse. So we're going to integrate the schools with us. We're going to bring black folks to white neighborhoods and put them in the school to help bring color and bring some type of change to them. So my mom said to me, you're not going there. That's not the place that you're going to be. You'll never get up there. They're not going to throw bricks at you. My cousin was on the back of the bus who mother said, well, listen, we got to get my daughter. But luckily, they sent up the police. And they made lines and so our family, our friends, our associates were able to make it home. But they still had to return to that. And so this kind of climate trickled down into the community that I lived in, the place that I loved and that I've shared for so many, many years with people that have been my friends and my family and my church that have been a part of this as well. So this is what turned me into the advocate, the spokesperson, the representative for my community. As we went through and we channeled, we left the 60s and we moved into the 70s and it became a time for us to think about changes in the neighborhood. The neighborhood began to change. So they decided that they were going to update what they call the uh, co-generation plan. Co-generation plan was going to turn into this major trash burning steam station in the middle of the neighborhood. So our mothers, those 60 or 70, those 50, 80 women that were in that neighborhood while our fathers worked. Because at that particular point in time, where I lived in public housing, you couldn't get in if you didn't have a daddy. Mm -hmm. You had to have a daddy in the house, or there was, a, there was some restrictions when you're coming into public housing. So the white folks were getting ready to move out Mr. Kelly back in 1970 when Mr. Kelly lived in McBride um, Street. He had his wife and his, his family there. They decided that he'd spend his time in war, and this, he was leaving this community. So the restrictions that were put on us were not put on him. He was given an opportunity to have a house, to buy a house, to buy a home, and on he went. So then they say to us, listen, you guys have to have two parents. You're not moving in such a village. You're not coming to find your home unless they're there. So some way, somehow, do those, do those women that were fussing and arguing about the issues to take care of our children, they went through this whole process. And one of the other things, after, we, after they finished this whole march and this whole protest about making sure that the cogeneration plan that was burning coal at the time was not going to be turned into a large incineration process. Place. So they weren't going to burn garbage. So they turned from there and turned it into a steam burning steam station. But before they did that, they wanted to make sure that people in the neighborhood knew that they didn't have a whole lot of value, that these communities weren't for you, that we built these for somebody else, and that it was a privilege for you to live here. So these women had to take on the national tenants movement. They had to go around this country and they had to argue and represent people that looked like me, that lived in those communities. They had to argue about the value of life and pursue liberty important that we be able to live here. But the other things that are so valuable and so important is that they talk many, many times about flowers. You know, I lived on Rainer Ave for many, many years after I lived in Stewart, after I lived in Wiser Court, 120 Wiser Court, for a number of years, mommy let me have all that. And I say mommy because it's that special and that precious to me that, that the 91 year old woman, <laughs> but I still call her mommy, even though she died about a couple of years ago. But mommy said, hey, did you have it? We'll let you have so I was able to live in higher homes in what at 120 miles of court where I lived for many, 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 many years. And I lived in this neighborhood and I worked in this neighborhood and I spent time sharing the kind of love and compassion that I received from my parents and my friends that living in public housing, living in communities of color does not mean that you're living poor. And that because you live in a situation that you don't have the same thing as your neighbor, because our people had a couple of hours in the neighborhood. I don't know if they got it from bootlegging. I don't know if they were gambling. I don't know what they were doing, but they were working. My dad drove, drove trucks across this country, and he had books in those trucks, and he took them from one point A to point B. But I think the valuable thing is that on Rainer Avenue and my mother's yard, we had flowers. And I think that there was this whole array of flowers, this whole array. You mean elephant ears, they used to call these. I don't know what the technical name for them, but they had these large ears, they had all these beautiful roses. And across our community, it was almost like this competition for, for planting flowers. 
making sure that everybody's yard had flowers in it. And, and that is the one thing that leads me to this thing about being tethered to your neighborhood, having a place to plant your memories, hold your dreams, share your life with. So when you take, when you look at a community like the public housing community, we are tethered to these communities from across this country because most of the people that are in this city that look like me and have been here for a long period of time have spent some time in public housing, some time in that particular community. So while we, we're here to leave our memories, to share our dreams, part of the problem is that we can find now that people are looking to uproot us, to take those things that we planted here, that we shared here, that we lived here with, and they want to pull them out and just get rid of them. So for an example, if you take the plants, you look at those plants on those tables over there. Those plants, those plants have had an opportunity to grow, to be watered, to be nurtured, and to be rooted, and to live here, and to have this opportunity to receive the sun, to receive the care, to receive the love that gives us that thing that makes us who we are. But if you uh, take that plant and you pull it out of the ground, you just pull it out of the pot. You see that all of those things that are underneath it become lost. They fall to the wayside. They, they, they become destroyed. And so as, as they take and uproot us from our community, those things that we've left here are no longer going to be available for those, that, those of us that we leave here. So as our children get older and they grow, and as they learn, they can't go back to those people. Say, I lived on this block, my parents lived on this block because they did those things up and they get better. And that's what's happened to our neighborhood. That's what's going to happen to our neighborhood. So, an example of survival in our neighborhood is one of them, one of the things that we have to do that when they decided that the co generation plant was going to turn from coal burning to steam station, the mothers of my community rallied behind, we got to learn a little bit more about what's going on in this plant. So I had the responsibility of being told by many of the mothers in the community that if you can teach David when it doesn't want to leave. The, the, and that's the great thing. The plant doesn't want to leave. That's it. That's it. <laughs> and so for me, this opportunity to to, for, to represent my, my mothers, my sisters, my cousins, my aunts, my great grandparents, my grandparents. And when they said that in order for us to live, live and understand what's going on with this steam station, this, this coal generation plant that was now burning coal, you have to take little David and explain to him what it is. So I spent about 14 days in Amsterdam, Holland, parts of Zurich, Switzerland, some parts of Germany. This poor boy from the neighborhood learning about co-generation so that I can come back and represent my folks properly to understand that they were going to take these large turbines and begin to turn water and bleach to create the steam and so that they could do this co-generation thing that they're going to do in our, in our neighborhood, which was the, the, the um, heating plant that's right there now in, 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 on the Bride Street. Right. But at the, <laughs> at the same time, we were dealing with all of the toxins coming off of the highway. So at one particular point in time, they put up a monitor right there at Tyler Court, Tyler Court and Adam Street. They hung this monitor out, the Environmental Protection Agency, all of the folks that make sure that you're breathing correct, that you're breathing okay. They hung this thing out, gas changed from lead to unleaded. They moved it on the inside. Then, so that now that the cars are hovering out there waiting to go to the dome, waiting to go to the um, highway there, now gets no monitoring because it's in Tyler Court. Eventually, it moves in Tyler Court to, uh, I'm aware of when after that. Mm -hmm. you know, I, was, I was probably a, a freshman in college and I realized that we lost that monitor. And then public housing had also talked about sleeving every unit in the housing to put an air conditioning system in to help reduce the amount of impact that's being done on those staff. So this journey that I've experienced in public housing, this journey that I've been through this particular area that we call the 15th Ward, has been one of graciousness, humbleness, and excitement about the fact that I live in a place that people who live there care about that community that they live in. I live in a place that people want that community to stay. So as I progressively got older and got a little smarter, when they decided they were going to change the co-generation plant, 
and turn it into a steam burner. Mind you, no steam goes to any part of the community that I live in. It just went to the university. So we were able to negotiate a scholarship program at Syracuse University as one of the payments to for this steam station happened. That scholarship was some of the best scholarships that were given to athletes, better than those of those athletes. And many of our young people, people like Powers' sister and um, uh, Powers' cousin, those folks who could have had the opportunity to take that scholarship chose to leave the city and go other places to school. But the good thing about it is that the opportunity was there. So we've had a number of success stories from those folks spending time at the university with that scholarship. But we also had the opportunity to, to explore with the 12 to 14 year olds. We took them up to Shaw Hall. We kept them in those communities over the summer, spending time learning about college, interacting with college students. But those kind of things are going to be lost now. Those are the kinds of things that we do. So when you talk about a place that you want to live in, a place that you live, you love, you learn, and you ultimately and eventually you live, you leave, but that's because of death. But while you're there, you leave your memories, you leave those things you trust to people. And if we get dug up and taken away, then <laughs> there is no place to leave. But I, I, I like the strength of those who stay back to stay there and they plan to stay. And so I'm on that same team. I'm on that same team. Yeah. You don't have to integrate in, 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 with, with anybody to improve me. All you have to do is give me the proper resources, those things that I'm eligible for, those things that should be invested in my neighborhood. That's all you got to do is make the investment in the community. And we can keep the community safe. We can keep the community decent. We keep the community sanitary. Unfortunately, there are so many people that believe that the struggles that they're receiving now, they're putting them on their backs. So we got all of these elements on an 85-year-old woman who's standing up there next to you, and she's so tired from the struggle. You know, she's standing there, she said, hey, David, and you look to her, she's about to faint. But she's out there because she don't want her community to leave. So you got to stop what you're doing and catch that lady. you got to catch that 85-year-old who's walked from her apartment to King's School to make sure that her voice is heard, that she has representation. So she shows up on a Friday when people are coming out to talk about changing the neighborhood, putting in a, a roundabout at Dr. King's school, dropping the bridge less than 150 feet from the school. The 85 year old Miss, Miss Francis mm -hmm. shows up there to say, listen, you can't do that in this community. But she's so weary from the many, many things that she's having to deal with on a daily basis. Her health, her medicine, her community being changed. So if you've got people that are burdened with life already, and then you turn around and you add more to that burden, you can crush them. So that's why we stand strong for our people. That's why we stand strong for our community. We're not moving anywhere, we're not going anywhere without some real opportunity for us to be engaged and share this kind of change. If there is to be change, it needs to be change for us, with us, mostly by us. It shouldn't happen, whatever. It shouldn't just happen. But you want to move to a better place for people to live with. You live with uh, the doctors that are over at the tower or the, the doctors who are working at upstate. It's a much better community if you mix it with them. I got nothing against them because some of my best, some of my closest friends are doctors and lawyers. So I'm in, in the machine. So what I have a problem with is that when you don't value, value how much value I have to this community, you decide that you're going to do it for me, not with me. And I think that's part of the problem that is. I'm going to sit down and shut up because I've talked for quite a bit of time. So that's for me in my story. Tonight, but right now I'd like to give the microphone. 
How we doing? Yeah. How many how many of you guys know me from somewhere, whether it be a high one conversation or anywhere? Okay, so I'm not as famous as I thought, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna give you a little you know, quick bio on myself. Yes. <laughs> so I'm gonna give you a little, a little background on myself. I'm a Joe Pascal, 28. I'm, I'm a local entrepreneur from Syracuse. I'm a resident or a past resident for uh, 15, 15 board. I grew up in that area. Uh, I have a lot of things that I grew up in that area. It was more of a generational kind of situation. We were all rooted in that situation, in that, you know, in that community, like David said. Um, you know, you got to pick this up here. My father, my grandfather, you know, as a kid. I just want to know pretty much how far we go back into the community. So there's a strong, there's, there's, a, there's a pull, you know, when it comes to the pioneer homes in the 50s. Um, as of all, uh, as of lately getting like one of the newer members of the pioneer homes, you know, pretty much picking back on what giving them the necessary. It, it pretty much gives you like a feel of, it gives you a community feel from the people's point, from the people's perspective, that as far as the systems go and as, as it's run down there, there's there's a lot that could be fixed. There's a lot that could be man, uh, maintained or, or, or better managed. You know, there's a lot that we're missing out on. So I don't, I don't get a sense of uh, being robbed or, or, you know, it's like when you, when you, when you go to these meetings and you talk to these people and it's like they're making blind promises. They're just giving you, it's like they're talking to you, you know, with, with Empathetic smile or empathetic, empathetic gesture on their face, but they got their finger crossed behind their back. So, you know, it's almost like we really can't, but we don't need it. gives you a sense of like if I, if I do say something about the problems that I have out here, you know, considering the fact that you have all these people out here that don't even live here, that don't belong here, you know, they used to live here before, but they, they just care because they got friends over there. If I say something to speak up to somebody, will I, will I be faced with retaliation from either the people that? Run this building or the people that live here or the people that stay here but don't actually reside here. You know, this this there's so much going on down there last year. It's basically what I talking about me. He was also saying about the flowers, you know. I also wear this flower right here for metaphorical purposes, which is to say, you know, I'm the rose that grew from the concrete. So I'm that one, I'm I'm the person, not only am I the rose that grew from the concrete, but just like a rose. How beautiful. <laughs> you know, so hopefully, hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll get back to that that community move, that community standard where you can come in and you can see the welcome signs that say, hey, welcome to the pioneer homes that will actually make you feel welcome because that's one of the amenities for a community that will let you know you're actually coming into a nice area. Now, when you come down to the pioneer homes, you, you'll see people standing on the corner, you see kids playing around a basketball court, you might see some broken glass or something like that somewhere. That that's not a feel of, of local. You know, that's not a welcome feel. That's that, but that's your that's your sign right there. It's almost like a like a home you know, that you pretty much stepping into. You know, and it wasn't always like that. You know, you got you got people like David and Lanessa that 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 know how things were back in the day and they know that things are pretty much it's very much like they head back to the same the same motion, you know. So you got people like me who try to take these these conversations and these forums and these you know, being on these panels, I try to take it back to the people that don't necessarily know that meetings are meetings like these are even happening and that they need to be in rooms like these because, you know, no one is half the battle. You know what I'm saying? No one is half the battle, but they also say knowledge is power. And I, 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 I can see where that comes from because nine times out of ten, if I told someone right now that I'm in here having a conversation, I'm on a panel discussing what's going on in the pioneer homes with people, not a lot of people would actually know what's going on. I'm, I'm honestly surprised that. This many people showed up right here, and it's not people that actually, I hate to say it like this, but it's not the people that really, really need to actually, I don't even want to say that, but there's more people that need to be here in these meetings because these conversations are about them. It's about the, you know, the importance of them. It's about the embedment of the future of them. And they don't even know that, 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 that these conversations are being had. That's a problem in any room that you're in when someone's speaking upon you, but they're not speaking to you. You know what I'm saying? 
if you're not there to actually know what's going on, you could literally be walking into a blind trap and thinking that you're just walking into your community you're going home with. Well, you don't even have a home anymore because they were disgusted enough or we don't move you somewhere else and aren't even telling you what. Whatever. It's this of us. It's just I'm starting to smell you guys. <laughs> now, I've uh, I've done some, I've had some conversations where I've spoken to like, uh, like you know, BBC News, and when I speak to them, I was basically telling them the basic things that I feel like a neighborhood should have, neighborhood should have to feel like it's an actual community, not just a neighborhood. Because, you know, one of the root words in neighborhood is hood, and that's also what is labeled on our backs. Like, as an African American man and a big, a big guy, I'm basically a walking billboard to some folks. I'm a walking billboard of poverty or anger or destruction. I don't want that to be the label. I don't want that to be the stigma when it comes to billboards. You know, we have a community grouping. If, if you actually look underneath all that rubble and dust and dirt, there's a community living in there. You know, you can go next door and knock on the door and ask for a cup of sugar, you know, and actually get it. Sometimes you might not have a cup of sugar, so somebody can go grocery shopping, but you know, <laughs> if, if you ask for it, you know, you know, now you can receive it. And that person next door knows that this is the kind, of, the kind of relationship that you have. That's also the kind of relationship that you need. Because there's too many people out here with that I got my mentality. I got my own. As long as my family's okay, as long as we can eat today, we don't worry about the next neighbor. But if everybody focused on, you know, everyone else's happiness, we could all find each other's happiness and hand it to each other rather than just I moving their happiness out of the way to look for mine. You know, I feel like that's one of the big things when it comes to dealing with the people down there in the 15th floor. There's so much love to be given out, but there's not an opportunity for people to actually project the love that they have. You know, there, there's, there's so much care, there's so much empathy. And like I said, it, it takes a community to raise a child. You have a community down there, but they're so, they're, they're being so passionate, like, like being told that they're not a community or they're just a neighborhood. And being so passionate, they can't do their actual job. They, they can't take the community if the community suffering. If you're trying to displace the community, if you're trying to break the community up, there will be no community. That's kind of the problem that we have right now. You know, they say, you can't be the kid, you can't be the kid, which you know, a lot of the people that, that, that are not, that are having been now, they out here running crazy. You know, <laughs> they out here running all, like they, they, don't, they don't have any kind of home training. And being down there in the kind of home, dealing with those kind of families, you might walk next door and, and talk to a lady that could be a complete stranger, but you know, later on down the line in a year, let's say a couple months, that lady might go to be like an ox to you or something like that. You actually feel a sense of love, a sense of family down there. You know, but there's too, there's, there's too much going on as far as the system, you know. So when you, when you it's almost like it's the king down there. Not, not really, but it's almost like it's the king down there. Because if you want to have a community down there, like, help us pick some of this stuff up. Make this stuff more acceptable to the eye. Make it, make it more, make it less of an eye system, you know. We need the the flowers brought back in there to make it beautiful so so people can actually want to walk through here i see i, I started seeing people jogging through the pioneer home and i'm like but like, you don't know what you are you know what, you like, you know what i'm saying i have you feel like i'm ready to go too but if i start to run i might get followed by the police or something you know what i'm saying so it's, it's, it's a complete it's a complete it's so crazy but it's a, it's a beautiful place to be it's a beautiful place it's a beautiful thing to see you got in the, in the summertime, you can literally walk on the block and hear these people playing their step in the name of love or playing their music. They all dancing, cha cha, starting, whatever the case may be. And you know, this is family. Even though you don't know them, you can walk up to these people and say, I'm hungry. And they will give you a plate of barbecue, a barbecue, a plate of food off the grill right in there. You don't necessarily have to know them for you to actually be involved in their lives if you to actually be considered family. They'll just show you, they'll, they'll just show you family. They'll be your family just because you live down there. If you were actually born or raised in that community, you're a part of the community. If you come in that community and you're new and these people start to see you, you're a part of that community. You know what I'm saying? Um, anything else? That's my dad. You just saw he was past a couple months ago. Bro. He was uh he was born down there in the pioneer home. And I feel like he passed with the kind of homes in his heart because he came from that. He, he was just a, a giant, a superhero. Yeah, yeah he was like a spokesperson for the kind of homes, if you ask me. But he had yeah, people around him that were way older than him. He was literally, you know, giving them advice, teaching them, you know, teaching them things. So he, he was a little ahead of his time. And I feel like I'm following in his footsteps. You know, these are my young officers that are also raised in the kind of homes and the breaks away. We were literally brought up around that area. 
I'm like, as far as anything goes, as, as far as like displacement, we need to figure out the plan. I'm hearing so so many so many problems, but not enough solutions when it comes to the problem. And I'm not one of the kind of people that like to listen to problems. I, I, I always try to figure out a solution for something, at least two. So I can know if this doesn't work, I can go, go about it this way right here. I'm not a pessimist because it pays to be optimistic about the administration. In this situation right here, you have to be both pessimistic and optimistic. And it's in the sense of, you know, if they, if they move the people, what are they going to do with the people? What are the programs or what are the options that they're going to provide for these people to actually move and where will they move them? You know, are they going to give them some kind of government assistance programs? Are they going to give them money? What are they going to do? You know, and, and, and also in the sense of, you know, just, just look at these smiles, look at these faces, look at, these people. Look, look at how happy he was. And look at the environment that he was in. He was standing down there in the primary room. Look at that smile on his face. You, you can only be that happy either dealing with a lady friend, family, money, or a new puppy. I mean, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That right there says a lot to me. That's too to me. I didn't want to put his feet in there, but it was a little action. <laughs> I also just wanted you guys to see him because, like I said, he passed, and I just wanted you guys to know. So here you go. Thank you. So, if you guys don't mind me asking, what did you feel like would be a basic necessity that would be that should be implemented into a neighborhood for it to actually feel like a neighborhood? What do you think that there should be? So we're going to ask you to write it, grab a sticky note, we have more sticky notes, grab some from another chair, if you need to call the platform, you would like to hear. So the question again is, what do you think, um, what do you think should be included? What, what, is, your, what is your ideal version of a neighborhood? Your, okay. ideal, your ideal version of a neighborhood. Put down whatever you want, as many as you want, just put them down. Yeah. But you never know. These 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 sticky notes might get to the, to somebody that might be able to you know put some things in motion. So yeah, like that. You gonna play some music? Yeah, play some music. Right? Anybody know how to cha cha slide? Yeah. Electric slide. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps. 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 Yeah. We got a cha cha slide and they're writing this down. <laughs> Y'all gonna, gonna dance with me? Y'all gonna dance with me? Y'all gonna dance with me? Y'all gonna dance with me? And this is the music of the neighborhood, right? Now, pick stuff like this play, and when it, when it play, it gives you, like, brings you right back to the home and every setting. We play these right here to get the kick out some barbecue started. Everybody join in, they start doing their thing. This right here, snapping the name along, the electric slide. Beautiful music. Bring you back to a certain spot. I'm sure we all had a fun, uh, fun time in our life where we can either smell something or taste something that will bring us back to a particular point in our lives. And this is that this is that song right here. Is the tearing down of McKinley housing to make for a supermarket? Is that still being considered? How do we stop that? Those homes are important, and how do we use elsewhere for a supermarket or other valuable services for this neighborhood with the destru destruction of valuable and good housing that took years to put up? So, <laughs> <laughs> 
I think that's a really good question. I think that's a really good question. Um, and what I'll say is we don't have enough information to know if they're planning on tearing down the McKinley Manor for um, a grocery store. Um, that was a rumor that was circulating maybe a few summers ago, but I don't think that's what they're currently planning to do. But I think the best people to approach about that would be Bill Simmons from the Syracuse Housing Authority, and you'd want to contact your print good team with their community partners in the redevelopment um, to really give you a clear answer on what they're developing. But I think there's a, a really good, important piece to this. When we talk about the Syracuse Housing uh, Authority community behind your home specifically, and people talk about how long ago it was built and how aged it is. Um, but put, to put it into context, right, we have houses that were built in the 1800s in Syracuse that are currently being lived in. We have houses that were built in the 1900s. My house was built in 1910, right? So we know that houses, even though they're hundreds of years old, can be maintained if maintained properly. Um, so I will say that much. I don't think the age of the apartment complex really comes into play when you talk about redevelopment. I really think it's the idea of what public housing looks like now in 2021 versus what it was supposed to look like back then. And like a fun fact, Syracuse Community Housing Authority and um, Pioneer Home Central Village, they were built specifically for families, right? So they weren't built for the single person. And I think David talked about this when he said, you had to have a dad if you wanted to live there. And the policy behind that was, though the affordable housing units were built for returning vets, Right, so they were built for families that were returning from war and needed somewhere to reside in the meantime, right? And so you had, in the 1930s and 40s, Syracuse Housing Authority, Pioneer Homes, was a completely white neighborhood. And I think a lot of folks who cited that, it was a completely white neighborhood until the Homestead Act. And so the Homestead Act basically said you can buy land for basically dirt cheap if you were in the Army and you were a person who was white. Right? And so those things are granted to you. And again, I think it goes back to when we talk about race-based policies and how they impact us now. And like this real failure to kind of do a racial equity study so we can have the hard numbers. Like how many Black vets returned to Syracuse after war during that time that would have been eligible to buy a house if not for the color of their skin? This is, this is information and data that we can actually pull. So like, let's look at that number and think about, okay, how do we redress that now? So we know, let's say, for example, we know 500 people came from war that would have been eligible to buy homes if not for the race-based policy. So what can we do now to redress that, right? Let's make houses at the price point they would have been in 1939 in higher opportunity areas and sell those houses to folks who are people of color for that price, right? That's a way that you redress past practices, right? It's called restorative justice, or it's also called reparations, which folks are really afraid of what that means when we talk about reparations. Reparations simply mean paying out someone something that they are owed, right? So it's not let's give people a government handout. It's not let's talk about how we can give people free things. The United States government has given our reparations over 17 times in, this, in, this, in, in, our, in our country's history. So an easy way to look at reparations would be see how did the racist housing practices prevent black and brown and immigrant families from buying homes? And how can we now make homes affordable at the price they would have been if they would have bought the house in 1930? That's a simple way to make someone become a homeowner. It's a simple way to integrate high opportunity areas and diversify neighborhoods. <laughs> I heard that some of the impetus for the team was because um, uh, the federal government gets some funding, SHA, to fix up the homes and make them really good homes and places to live. Like you said, you know, to really make them great places. So is that true that there's this is sort of a way to deal with it? the fact that they're fumbling and they do a lot of work? That's, that's a, I mean, I, 
I, I'm going to pass this over to David. Um, I think we all kind of recently remember the news article about maybe three summers ago where our Turkey Housing Authority had to return, I think, about $6 million because they had failed to find a way to spend it. Um, but what I will say is um, maybe that should be the advocacy point, right? Not to say the federal government has, no, has decided to no longer invest in public housing, which was really true under the Trump administration yeah. maybe even before. But maybe the advocacy is reinvest in public housing and not let's try to find other ways to kind of work around that. I mean, I think we, we've advocated and lobbied for other things that the federal government should be doing, but the, the fact of the matter is um, who's going to be advocating for public housing other than the marginalized people that live there? And how closely are they connected to the lobbyists or the advocates or have the resources to travel to Washington to say, reinvest in our public housing? Right. And I think the age of needing to have a whole family there is gone, right? So the resources are also gone. One of the big things about the in public housing was it was a huge political powerhouse. And that's the thing that we don't talk about a lot, right? Because you had middle class families living in public housing with middle class incomes who would meet weekly at the Dunbar Center to talk about political problems. And so the forgotten part is this was a political powerhouse and it was well funded and it was based on black families. So now we have a situation where if you have a criminal record, you can't live in public housing. If you have all these other things, you can't live in public housing. So there's a breaking up of the family. And so that kind of power is lost. And obviously the rules are almost have a husband or a wife, but they're long gone, right? They shouldn't be. Um, but those are long gone. So you have these kind of broken peaceful families who don't have the same political gain or access they had before. So maybe the push should be for, for, for the federal government to get back into public housing and not. I think, you know, housing is a basic race, but better than it should be at home. You know, I just think that um, I know that from my own personal experience is public housing is funded based on its occupancy. You continue your occupancy rates, you keep your occupancy rates at the proper level, 90%, you get your subsidies. They may not be offering as much subsidy for modernization. But in the past, public housing in this community has had, have experienced renovations. They've gone through, and Central Village has been reduced and redone from, say, 280 units to, to 143 units. So they've taken the tops off of the townhouses. They've upgraded the roofing system. You're talking about Pioneer Homes was built in the 1930s. I think the sign is still on the wall. There was an opportunity there for renovations they did you know, they sealed some of the bad in the places, they changed the roofing system. So I think that as long as you occupy your units and you make your investment into those units, then those units can survive. I think that there's misnomers about the government is moving out of public housing. They wanna privatize as much public housing as possible, but that's the political whim. That's what's going on politically. You know, the party right now should be changing that. They should be moving in that same direction. So there should be a change in policies around public housing. There have been, at, at one particular point in time, there was more than 4 million public housing residents across this country that, that Vanessa spoke to of as being a powerhouse. And there was a national tenant organization movement that kept tenants involved in policies and, procedure, and procedures. Secretary Cisneros had made it his business to incorporate residents in his decisions when they were working on policies around public housing, the McKinney Act, and those things that, input, that, were, institution, that were institutionalized in public housing. He made sure that tenants participate. Jack Kemp, who was the Secretary of HUD, came to Syracuse to speak specifically to residents about becoming homeowners. And as an example of that, you can look at McBride Street, Rainer Avenue, some parts of Rose Ave, where the Syracuse Housing Partnership Program under the, at the Mayor Young administration took people from public housing and made them homeowners, helped them become homeowners. So those kind of model programs can be duplicated and put into place if people are thinking outside the box. And then when, you, when you're developing business, we have business corridors on, in the city of Syracuse. We should be enhancing those business corridors and then using two blocks in to enhance the resident population so that those people can then use those business corridors. It makes no sense to take residential and turn it into commercial 
when you already have areas zoned for residential and commercial mixed use, you know, two story buildings, four story buildings that can go on Salina Street and for grocery stores and those kind of things in those areas. I think that we just need to be a little bit more clever about our thinking and think outside the box and not get caught up into, we got too many poor people living together. So we need to get rid of them in order to make things better. And what would be the outcome of reach if they do the mixed living? <clears throat> because at that point, it's like, do you really believe that rich people are going to want to live next to people that they consider to be poor? You know what I mean? I feel like they're going to just push the rest of the people up that already live there to make more room for people that, are, that have better jobs and better gigs coming in. Location, location, it's location. It's all about location. <laughs> <laughs> so, I have Can you tell us about why roses? I, I think that one of the things that we talk about roses, you know, there is this Tupac had an opportunity to create a song that they call Roses Grows in Concrete. And in, 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 in public, the public housing community, one of my other lives that I've lived in this, in this community is that I, I planned and programmed for young people living in the public housing community for more than 30 years over a period of time. So we've had an opportunity to identify young people that were promising. We had this young lady by the name of Contessa Flowers who used to write this wonderful poetry. And she would always write about roses and identifying each individual kid as a rose that has lived in this concrete environment, but this rose had had an opportunity to grow and it's come through concrete. And then this rising through this concrete symbolizes that a young person has had some success in their life they've done some good things. So you would find our uniforms that would have roses on them. You would find that our mentoring and tutoring program was associated with roses. So a rose grown from concrete is typically, and from just typically identified that our successful young people. We had a map that showed where young people had gone all across this country to college, where young people had gone to various institutions of higher learning that they spent time with other people. So that rose was symbolic to the success of young black children in our community. And so Tupac talked about it, you could grow flowers and plants anywhere. And so a rose could be grown from concrete. And that rose was so many of our young people living in our public housing community. And we have them now, you can see them in our, in our legislative chambers, you can see them in our council chambers, you can see them running for mayor, you can see them as teachers, you can see them as healthcare providers, you can see them as doctors, and the whole gamut of those young people coming out of the public health community has been those that we symbolize as our roses, those things that have made our life better, that continue to make our life better, and they'll those things that are exciting for people to look at. You know, roses that grow some kind of Yeah, kind of free. For some of the responses from Joe Quinn's uh, question. Um, and your question is What does your ideal neighborhood look like? One that is secure so children can play safely on the block of the neighborhood. Ideal neighborhood opportunity within reach, green space, a view to the horizon, peace. <laughs> Ideal hood can use one or more community centers. <laughs> Friends, family, education, sports teams, restaurants, family owned businesses, events, mentors, parks, beauty, welcome. Ideal community, flowers, friends, amenities like laundry, waste and water, dog park, subway access, sunshine through the windows. What is your ideal version of a neighborhood community? Inclusive schools, black owned businesses, restaurants, boutiques and shops, parks and places with nature. An office where people can take their concerns 
regarding their living situation. Um, children in the neighborhood, ch child care, sorry, child care in the neighborhood, so parents can work. Universal Center with mental health, a mental health center, a YMCA, affordable grocery store, pharmacy, barbershop, cleaner, a rec center with indoor pool, yeah. basketball. Community spaces, green spaces, parks, fields, places to play, access to affordable food, clean water, um, public transport. Ideal Hood has clean, friendly parks for ball and picnics. Porches, green spaces, playgrounds, community room. Office where people can go talk about plumbing, housing, electricity, etc. Maintenance. I think that's a question we're going to talk about now. Um, equality for all who live there. Equal opportunity to food, education, community, school, safety, and growth. Community, regardless of color, salary, education, building on differences and growing together. Thank you all. So I'm gonna log one. I guess oh, have some from the chat okay. as well. Uh, people who actually know their neighbors, talk to them, feel free to come out of their homes to socialize with one another and socialize with others who may wander into their neighborhoods. Um, real drugstore or pharmacy in walking distance a community center with a place for a coffee house and gathering people for gathering place for people to sit and meet each other. Safe streets, many housing opportunities, local businesses for ease of access to ordinary household items, community spaces like parks and places for public to gather locally for community, community meetings and events, uh, safe public places for people to gather. Yeah, I mean, isn't it? I feel like we should put this all in a letter and send it. <laughs> um, but yeah, just on, on, on the great, you know, the thing of maintenance. We, we, when we had the meeting and we were talking and I was learning so much and just the idea that maintenance has fallen away, right? And it was something that Ms. Fudge was gonna talk about. It was like, wait a minute, they used to come and cut our grass. They don't cut our grass anymore. You know, if they don't pick up our garbage, we look like the ones that have, have made the, the sidewalk gross, but we put out our garbage for someone to go pick it up. Um, the construction of, or the deconstruction of sidewalks, right? And who's in charge of fixing them? So I don't know, David or anyone of you would like to talk on that. Okay. okay. All right, so as far as maintenance goes for the private homes, I feel like there could be a lot more done in regards to the actual fixing up of the private homes. Like there's things like the minor things that will make you feel welcome in a community again, like uh, the fences being messed up or something like that, or your, your doors being uh, kicked in or the glass being broken downstairs. So it, it takes away that sense of uh, security when you have to worry about coming downstairs and the door being propped open or something for somebody who wants to be home you know, it's, it's a lot of factors, factors into situations like that. I feel like personally, if there is too much of an issue regarding maintenance, a solution for that right there could be to potentially create like some kind of program that will allow the people or the, the younger kids that live down there right now, allow them to go around and, you know, clean up some things and give them some sort of incentive, whether it be you actually are right, we're gonna open up the pools for you, you know, in the summertime, and you might be able to get a little party based on you know, the, the fact of all, like the budget of certain self authority, I don't necessarily know, I can't speak on it on that, but it's incentives, I, I, with the amount of work that I've done dealing with the youth, incentives always work. So if you want something to be done, you either have to do it yourself, 
or you have to pay someone to do what you don't want to do. So somehow, some way, you have to figure out somebody, figure out a way to pay somebody to get something done. But without anything being done, it's just gonna, it's gonna run itself into the ground. Like nothing maintains itself. So like one of the examples um, that the other speaker who couldn't make it shared was that they used to come around weekly and mow the lawn and make sure everything was kept up and that kind of just disappeared as the budget got tighter the maintenance map staff got smaller and so their jobs got stretched so lawns went without being mowed and just to put things in context if you live in public housing you're not personally allowed to do those kind of maintenance right you're supposed to allow your maintenance company to do those things for you um, and so if the, if the grass is not cut, if the flowers are not kept, if the fence breaks and the fence is not fixed, right? People come in your neighborhood and they're judging you. They don't look to say, well, it must be your maintenance company that's not doing it. They're judging you. Um, there was a point in time where maintenance would come in and do um, surprise visits and random checks to make sure that inside of the house was clean, that you didn't have roaches or a bug infestation. And if you did, they would clean it. They would bomb it. They would uh, exterminate. Um, those things start happening less and less frequently. And so if someone is experiencing something, let's say they do have an infestation, which we all have some type of, every winter I get these two mites. Um, I don't know where they come from, they just come back every winter. Yeah. Um, but like, um, you know, you call, you put a work order in and sometimes your work order could take six weeks for someone to show up, right? And so you're not supposed to put up your blinds if you live in public housing. You're not supposed to hang pictures on your wall, right? Because you don't want, they don't want holes in their walls. So you're supposed to be calling maintenance for all of these type of things. But when maintenance doesn't show up and your blinds are torn because you have a toddler or you have a dog, right? But your blinds are now broken and they stay that way for weeks or months. Um, they start to call your neighborhood dirty you start to feel like you're dirty right and so a lot of that was like the psychology behind you feeling helpless that you can't maintain your own property right because you don't own the property but maintenance is so stretched that they also can't maintain the property um and so you're in a situation where you feel like you have no control over how your neighborhood looks but everyone is looking at you blaming you for how your neighborhood looks and one of the examples was there was some fencing that was just got ugly. And so this speaker, um, she put a petition together and walked around to all the neighbors and were like, we want a replacement fence that looks friendlier, it doesn't break every other day. Um, and their solution was they just removed the fence. And that fence had vines and flowers and it was pretty. And so they just went and removed all the fencing and was like, this is becoming too much of a hassle. Now there's a petition that's been circulated for this fence to get fixed. So our solution is to move it. And that's something that that community cherished and it's now gone. And so like having generations of family living in a community they feel deeply tied to, but also having that dynamic where you have no control over how that community looks it does something to you emotionally and spiritually. And I think if you're a homeowner, if you grew up in a home, you know there's always that competition of who can have the best garden, right? Who forgot to mow their lawn that Saturday? They're, now, they're, now their lawn looks cruddy or, you know, what, what kid left the juice box on the floor? You might go across the street and pick it up. Um, but not having that same autonomy when you live in public housing, but then you see these reports, right? So they come out Syracuse reports at Syracuse.com. You see these reports about your neighborhood. It's almost devastating to you because you know that it's 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 beyond your control. Um, and it's also like maybe there's 17 million work orders in, and the maintenance is just stretched to the point where they can't get to everyone because there have been so many budget cuts that there isn't enough staff to cover the entire um, apartment complex. Yeah, um, like today, for instance, Today is Christ Pickup Day. I live in Pine Home, been here for 33 uh, years. So we uh, set our trash out on Sunday for today. So the, the same thing you just talked about, the trash is out there. The trash can is out there recycling that out there, not because I didn't put my trash up, they just didn't come to the neighborhood to collect. So I'm very upset about that. It looks like hey, she, she, she didn't put a trash out. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that makes sense, especially when um, this um, was going to speak about the fact that maintenance has been reduced 
It's, they're good workers. They're good workers. There's just not enough of them. They're good opportunity, just not enough of them. You know, and I think that um, to talk about the time that they used to provide flowers for people to plant, you know, they, they had competitions. They, they promoted flower planting, they promoted um, gardening. The, the mothers were, the mothers and the, the elders in the neighborhood encouraged you to, to plant your flowers for your memories, plant your flowers for the beauty of your neighborhood. Don't cut my grass and run over my flowers. And so in that whole process, when you reduce the maintenance, you reduce the service, you lessen the quality of the neighborhood. But it's not because they don't want to take care of it. It's just that there, there's not enough of them too. So there needs to be a bigger investment in upkeep. You know, in the upkeep approach. I just a little report, and maybe you know this, that uh, I heard that uh, You know, having pride in your neighborhood. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so we talk about like let's have a program for uh, maintenance workers. But then my my question it always goes back to who are we pulling those kids from? Are we going into these communities saying, hey, we have a program so that you can now become a maintenance worker in your own community? Are we giving them back their power? We talk about how are we developing future um, workers? Are we saying to the community members, look, we know this maintenance problem. We have a program right here. So if your son or your daughter is 18 year old or non-binary, if 18 or older, get them into this program so that they can live around the corner and they can also be your maintenance worker, right? Because that's always the question of like who's getting these jobs right, to do to do the work that needs to be done. And you know, you you take pride in taking care of what you own. And if you've been there for generations, you cannot tell Tyra that she is not an owner of a pioneer home, right? You, you just because I mean, it's, it's, if you live, I mean, just as if you think of us as kids, right? If you grow up in your parents' home, you don't think, well, this is my parents' home. You think this is our family home. Right? You ain't paid a mortgage payment ever, right? But you think this is our family right. home, and when you. And when you go off to college, you talk about my family's home. This is where I grew up. This is my neighborhood. You don't say this is where my parents rented or this is where I lived for free while I was a kid in my parents' house. So there's a sense of real ownership, especially for kids who were born there and raised there. There's that real sense of ownership. And so they have to be the driver in any decision that happens there. And we also talked about, like, if you've been in this uh, neighborhood for over 25 years, you should be entitled to some type of equity in this community yeah. the same way you would be if you lived in your own yeah. home okay, you would right. be entitled to some equity there. Right. So like share things like you should have some some more of a say so than you actually have right now because you're home you should basically be a board member you yeah. know what i'm saying like you represent that, that I'm, I'm board member so <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you should speak for that area and i feel like you should also be compensated for speaking for that area that's right, that's right. I think that part of saying anything you do, obviously. I think that that's what it is. If you represent that area, you should be compensated for it. If you work in that area, clean up. I feel like it'll be, it would be so much better if they actually gave these kids a so, You live here, you work here, you fix up your own community, you get paid to do something. That'll literally help them find a job later on down the line. You know, like I was mentioning before, like, you know, growing up as a kid, I had to wash the dishes all the time. So, when it comes to filling out a job application, I've got 20 years working on this <laughs> It works. It helps develop that child. So, I think that there's just this misconception that they don't understand that it's a rite of passage to some young people who are They look forward to working in maintenance. They look forward to getting a job or opportunity at house and income down. So I think that when they cater public housing to that type of it, that type of opportunity later on. So that was a, that was the big thing. Every every kid would work to come to the center to possibly get a job in the summertime working with I the did, other kids. I did. I had, every kid, I had that every opportunity kid, every kid. as a 
child. That's right. We are at 14 years old. Right. First summer job at Syracuse Housing. That's right. That's right. And I've been there for 14 years in my community. That was so investing. I had that chance. I ran the youth center down here. That's right. I, I did a lot. That's right. That was the investment in the community yes. to pull to keep it up, to keep to pull it up by its own self. Invest in the people that take care of the community, that take care of the neighborhood. And I think that's part of what's not happening. Now is this investment, you know, and, and locally we worry too much about federally, but if we take care of the neighborhood, we occupy its units, we collect its resources from them, then we make the investment back into them. And some of the folks do that. They do it very and what's done very well for a very long period of time. There's a question from the chat. What is the best way to deal with uh, the city zoning department to make sure that the land freed up by the deconstruction of 81 does re uh, react and reflect community input? Are they already holding meetings and making decisions that we need to be aware of and get ahead of? That's a great question. Well, so this is what I'll say. I'll just answer the question. Um, what we've been talking with the community members and with DOT is they need to be thinking about creating a community land trust. Um, the community land trust will be set up in a way that it's controlled and run by community residents, the same way a board is. Uh, we have community land trusts already in Syracuse. They're all, they're all they're everywhere. They're all across the nation. And basically what a community land trust does is it, it, it controls how much equity and inflation can happen on that land. And so what we know is when the IED1 comes down, uh, there's going to be 10.5 acres of land that becomes available. That's in big parcels, but there'll be small acres, uh, small parcels of land available as well. But in this specific community, there's going to be five acres that's going to be adjacent to MLK school, right? So all of that area right there is going to become developable, developable. And that is smack dab in that community, right? There's no qualms about it. It's not part of downtown. It's not part of Syracuse University. It's smack dab in that community. And the argument is, out of the 10 acres, those five acres need to be put in the community land trust. Now, what I will say on DOT's part, because we've been pushing this for a pretty long time, is they moved very, very far away from where we started. And so their original plan in 2019 was that all of the land that becomes available will be ideal for one or two bedroom apartments, right? So all of the red flags and alarms for the terrain when you hear about one or two bedroom apartments so close to Syracuse University, so close to ESF, so close to the hospitals, that these are going to be taken up by either the edge or the meds, and it's going to be for student housing or employee housing, where that was the first thought that we had. And so we did a lot of meetings with DOT, a lot of organizing the community, and we put together a collective group of comments that said, this is problematic because once you have high rises with student housing or higher level incomes, the rent around them start to inflate. So you start to see landlords raising their rent because now they're in a prime location, even though their apartments are still garbage. Or you'll start to see, um, property taxes increase because now the land around it is worth more. So you have folks who are low income or limited income, their taxes go from 2,000 a year to 4,000 a year, which is a hike they cannot afford. Um, so we started doing a lot of advocacy with DOT around this point. And so now what they're saying is that land will be put in a, they're going to create a community land working group. They still haven't said community land trust. But they're still miles away from where we started, and they're creating a community land working group, um, and so that they're going to collectively decide what the use of land will be. So I will say, if folks want to advocate for creating a community land trust, they need to go right to the IU one website. Um, we're still not there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so they need to go right to the IU one website. You can find it if you go IU one slash dot. Um, you'll, you'll be able to go right to the site and you'll be able to. <laughs>
You'll be able to email them directly. And, and you, what you want to say is the land that becomes available after the ID1 community grid happens needs to be put in a community land trust for the preservation of the current community. So that's the kind of language you want to use when you're submitting your comments to the DOT. The comment period has officially closed, but they're still collecting comments. So just put it in there. Um, I just want to talk. So we put together a letter. I think we can put up a letter. So um, you want to talk about? So we. So Vanessa was really great. She put together kind of a sample letter um, that we can pass around if you're interested. So if you want to go ahead and do that, um, it's in the Word doc. The Word doc that's pulled up on there. If you just press Word. So we kind of need to have to have to document. So we're gonna make sure folks get it in an email. Okay. All right. Do you want to talk about the process? No. Cool. Okay. All right. So we will we will email this if you have registered with us. We'll email you. Sorry, I thought we had enough. But um, it, it's really to kind of um, give some structure if you need it, um, and if you're interested. Um, and I do, I you know, as we're wrapping up, I do want to say thank you. To the three of you, mostly because of your courage. You're the three most courageous people I know coming to, to speak on this topic. And thank you for, for those members of the community that because it is a tough topic to kind of put truth to power when the power has found so many different ways to silence you. So I think it's really important that even when you're given a bureaucratic no, you find your yes, because, because the, the reality is, and what was really beautiful for me is what you said at the very, very beginning, people. This is about people. This is not about statistics. This is not about a max, right? This is not about even anything else. This is about people. And put yourself in the shoes of the people who are living through this process, through this bureaucracy, right? And don't throw another piece of form, paper, or whatever um, to, to make it more difficult. And also changing the, the language and everything else. Um, do we have Ashley, is she still on the program? So I'm going to just, first of all, again, thank you so, so much. Um, I'm going to, going to take these last few minutes um, because, as I said at the beginning, this is tied to this is tied to a, a production that we're going to be doing in the spring called "The Most Beautiful Home." Dot dot dot. Maybe right, and it is like we're doing here this interactive um, presentation, but really getting into the you know, why housing is important. And we invite all of you, obviously, to come. You all get an email about it. Um, and we also have more information on what's happening at Syracuse Stage. Thanks to all of you. You'll, you'll also get, like, discount tickets to Matilda, so you can take advantage. Um, and um, as well as, you know, being a white, you know, where this all initi initiated from, because you met with Mark two years ago, yeah. two years ago, where Mark said, you know, I really want, I've been looking at four cities in the United States, and I think Syracuse is one we need to be talking about on a national level. So, Kate, I'm going to have you have um, Ashley's course. Give me one second, Ashley. Okay. Hello. And give you one second to change it on the, the Zoom. I need to on. Okay. <laughs> okay. Great. Good to go. Okay, fantastic. Thank you all oh, so Oh, that's me. Just kidding. <laughs> Yeah. I know. <laughs> Can you say something? Sure. Maybe. Can you hear me? 
now I can't see anybody. This is awesome. Ah, thank you very much. Yeah, there you go. Yes. Yes. Maybe now. Yes, fantastic. I'm going to assume you all can hear me and somebody will put it into the chat if you can't. Um, I just want to thank you all so much, for, uh, especially Joanne, Ali, and Kate for organizing tonight. Um, this has been so informative and is exactly what Mark and I are hoping for as we're building out the most beautiful home, maybe. And um, I just, Lanessa, I appreciate you so much grounding us in the history of zoning and that history is infrastructure. And that context was critical tonight for us. And I was completely struck by the parallels of redlining, urban renewal, the highway transit mo movement to right now and rezoning, Blueprint 15, the highway deconstruction movement, like all of the ways in which we are hopefully ensuring that history does not repeat itself. And these are the kinds of conversations the show is uh, and the process that we're engaged with as artists were really, um, enjoying hosting and collaborating with in communities across the country right now. David, I have this snapshot of you at like 11 years old, listening to Muhammad Ali and hearing him say, don't let people take your community from you. And just like how that moment as a young child has like, like been a thread through so much of your life and hearing your stories and like your deep love of your community it just like radiates through these little zoom boxes which is really moving and um uh joanne i was so struck by this moment of trying to replant something in real time and just feeling like the plant doesn't want to move. And what does it mean when you are root bound to just hold on to where you are from? And what does that mean for this moment in this community? And that, that metaphor of like, I ain't going. Um, and Joheen, I just, the picture of your father and that smile um, and just hearing you talk about following in his footsteps. Um, just was really striking tonight. And part of what tonight did so beautifully is hold this relationship between policy. Like you all were really in the weeds on some policy about 25 years and you should be entitled to equity. That's a policy move. Supporting community land trusts, having houses available at the 1930s price, Yes, like these are policies that could be possible. Ending exclusionary zoning. And you did this by weaving together your stories of place. And I just wanna, this is like what we're experimenting with of how do we host conversations that integrate art, policy, personal story to hopefully support you all envisioning that beautiful community that you wrote about. And I hope that a letter does get written based on your amazing visions and mailed to someone. <laughs> Maybe the maintenance guy will read it. I don't know. Um, but I am just so thankful for your, um, your voices and your stories. And I'm also putting a note in the script about, can we get the cha-cha slide as part of the show? <laughs> so we're gonna see what happens folks. Um, and I look forward to seeing you all again in the coming months. And thank you so much. And I will pass back to Joanne and the Syracuse team. So with that, right on time, I want to thank everyone for coming. Um, and um, I don't know, do I put myself on mute? Okay, never mind. Um, and, uh, and thank you again to our fantastic panelists. And we have some roses that you can take home and uh, think about tonight. And just remember that we have some amazing roses in the concrete in the middle of Syracuse. Thank you all for being here tonight.